Hi, I'm Dr. Quinn Yost, board certified pediatric dentist and owner of Milk Tooth, which is where we are right now. I feel really lucky to get to be here with Casey Masaldani. She's a board certified speech language pathologist and she has a special interest in myofunctional therapy. She got her master's in speech language pathology from Hofstra University in New York. And we've been able to work together for a little while now. We met at a conference like, gosh, about a year ago. I can't believe it's been that long. And we clicked, it's, it's so funny the way that things work because we both have young kids. She just met my kids. They're like the same age. You know, we have this personal vested interest in like airway, myofunctional therapy because of what we're going through with our own kids. And so, and then she happens to live down the street from us. So <laughs> it's been really cool. I just felt so lucky that our paths crossed and then to be able to work with somebody of like Casey's caliber, that is really incredible. Uh, so that's why finally a year later we're actually doing this. We did it like we had all the books and then yeah. off the books. So uh, we're really glad to be doing this. Um, so I just want to start off with the big broad question, which is, you know, what is myofunctional therapy? So often I tell my patients, I think you should see a myofunctional therapist. And it takes a minute for a lot of people to understand that. Can you put that in simple terms? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So thanks so much for having me yeah. today. I'm so excited to talk about this. I'm very passionate about it and really grateful to be on this multidisciplinary team with you. So orofacial myofunctional therapy is a therapy modality that is provided by licensed and trained professionals to help the structures of the face, so the oral facial complex. So we're working on the lips, the cheeks, the tongue, and the jaw to work on goals such as nasal breathing, chewing and swallowing, clear speech production. And we do that through a series of targeted exercises, working on those structures um, to be able to exclusively nasal breathe, manage our food, manage our saliva, and be able to produce speech in a clear and effective way. Yeah, I love that. And that's just something that when you think of going to the dentist, a lot of people just expect me to tell them, hey, do I have cavities or not? Right. And when I start talking about the way that they breathe, I always have to kind of bring you or my functional into the picture because this idea of your tongue position, the way that we swallow, the position of the muscles of our mouth, and then the position of our jaws really is so important. And I think it's something that, you know, when we grew up as kids really often was not addressed yeah. unless it was really severe, yeah. right? And so um, I think something that I would be good for parents to know, what is, could you share what you think most parents should know about maybe some aspects of how their child sleeps, maybe how they should breathe when they sleep? Yeah. Um, I think that's something that we're seeing come more popularized, um, and I think it would be important for patients to hear from some of you. Yeah, so um, it's important for parents to know that children should be breathing through their nose with their lips closed. Um, oftentimes we see children mouth breathing, and it can be due to a variety of reasons, such as nasal obstruction, enlarged tonsils, amyloids, allergens, but also what oftentimes people don't realize that it could be because of the positioning of our tongue in our mouth. So sometimes we see low tongue resting posture, could be attributed to tongue tying or other differences in the mouth. Um, what we really want to see is the tongue resting up on the palate, allowing for nasal breathing, allowing for the airway to be open. Um, and as regarding sleep, um, children should be sleeping with their mouth closed, quietly breathing. Uh, snoring is not normal. Um, we don't want to see a lot of tossing and turning, talking in your sleep, bedwetting. Those are all actually signs um, there's something else going on. There's a root cause to those um, issues. And again, it's often the placement of our tongue. Yeah. So when we see something like snoring or maybe teeth grinding, that could be an indicator that the tongue is kind of falling back into the airway, blocking the airway, and the body goes into fight or flight mode. So it's trying to keep the airway open, which is why we see snoring or the teeth grinding. Yeah. Um, and these issues are kind of common, but we know the quote, common doesn't equal normal. So by doing this, early intervention is key. Um, by talking to parents about these issues, um, by starting the conversation, we're able to intervene earlier. Um, and by having this multidisciplinary approach, you know, working with professionals such as yourself, ENTs, and so forth, we can help.
help the structure as well as me. I work on the function, yeah. and the function changes the structure because we have muscle and bone. The muscle actually can move the bone, which is really interesting. And what God, I've been doing this for a long time, but just love learning about it more yeah. and more. There's just so much to always learn. I, I love that. You know, there, there's so many things, gosh, when you said that I like. The last thing you just said is how muscle can move or affect bone, right. especially in growing children. Yes. I think that's something that even in my traditional dental training, you know, maybe 10 years ago, we weren't taught in the way in which we understand it now. Yeah. I mean, the way I explain that to patients is, think about braces, mm -hmm. how do we move teeth? Right. We put pressure on the tooth and it moves the tooth. Right. Well, I say your tongue and your lips and your cheek, the way you swallow and the way you breathe are happening to your teeth all day long. So, so often um, the, the function of your mouth puts your teeth where they are. So addressing that root cause, someone like Casey, if there's, say, let's say it's a perfect world, there's no real physical anatomy. So there's no ENT issues. You don't have, you know, a nasal passage you can breathe through. You don't have big tonsils. You don't have a tongue tie. Maybe it's just the low tongue posture. It's a habit. Well, this is really cool because you can work with someone like Casey and maybe a couple other things and you can actually get straight teeth because of the way you swallow and breathe. Yeah. And so it's really amazing that to do less, but to get more from it, you know, this whole idea that I'm into is like treating the root problem. Yeah. And so I love that I can send, you know, patients to you and that there's those options. Yes. Um, the other thing you talked about is not normal for your kid to sleep with their mouth open. Yeah. Right? You know, part of why this is personal to me, I have one of my, I have three kids and one of my kids, their mouth is open. You and I have talked about that. I do a lot of things for that. Um, but it's it's a journey too, yes. right? And, and the classic picture of a baby is their mouth open, right? Yes. And that cute little baby. Right. But you and I know that's not that's what we want to see, right. right? That's not admit, maybe cute for a minute, but that's that's concerning yes. for you and I. Um, so I guess that leads me to you know for you, um, for myofunctional therapy, you know that requires um, a child to be able to kind of sit and listen to you, take on some exercise. Yeah. You know, parents are going to see this. I see my kids sleeping with their mouth open, my baby. Well, when is it they should see somebody like you? You know, when do you start working with kids? Yes, I love that question. So it's actually important to note that you can have an oral facial myofunctional disorder across the lifespan. Mm -hmm. You can be born with a tongue tie or a fine hour palate, um, which creates that OMD. Um, however, the therapy modality for infants is oral motor and feeding therapy mm -hmm. because when it's an infant, their number one job is to be able to sleep and to breathe and to eat, whether that's at the rest or through the bottle. So if a child is having difficulty with that, that's right off the bat a clinical indicator of dysfunction. So when I work with um, infants um, up until um, about three, four years old, it's actually oral sensory motor feeding therapy and speech sound disorder therapy. We incorporate the oral motor exercises and we're working on nasal breathing but we're doing it in a bit of a different way. Whereas at about four years old and up, depending on the cognitive status of the patient and their ability to follow directions, um, that's when we would refer to it as oral facial myofunctional therapy um, because that requires the volitional control to perform the exercises being prescribed. But needless to say, again, infants, they can still have this diagnosis, yeah. but they need the oral motor therapy, yeah. which is provided by the speech language pathologist, sometimes an OT or PT. Um, they do that oral motor therapy. Yeah. Um, four and up, we're doing OMT, yeah. and always working as a, as a team with other professionals. I like that, yeah. Yeah, you know, because sometimes I'll see, actually I had one today, I'll see a, a baby referred to me for, a, you know, wondering, is there a tongue or lip type, having some trouble feeding, but maybe there's nothing, right? It's very mild. Yeah. And maybe it's the maybe the palate's really high, so the tongue can't fit up there. Yeah. Or maybe there's some other reasons why they're needing help, but it doesn't have to do with the tongue or the tongue. Yes. And so you know, people like you or OTs who can work on that. Yes. Is really good. Um, yes. But just yeah. to yeah. put on that point, um, off that group and even older children often have those prolonged noxious oral habits, such as thumb sucking or continued pacifier use. Um, prolonged bottle drinking, um, which is creating that high narrow palate, contributing factor, genetics also play a role. Um, and a lot of different prolonged oral, oral habits actually, you know, sometimes chewing on the shirt, blanket, um, and that takes a good clinician who's a, a 
investigator, so to speak, to kind of get this information um, from the parents and be a compassionate person as well and know that we're not shaming you because of these habits. We want to help you. And I found by talking to children like that, I really helped them remediate their noxious oral habits and replace it. We say your tongue can replace your thumb or whatever else it may be. Um, and, and really working with the kid one-on-one -on -one like they're uh, just talking to them like a regular person about yeah. this. I think that's so huge, right? Is, is treating them with that autonomy. I yeah. Mean, I, so I, I talk to, I see a lot of young children, babies too, and so I always, sometimes parents are like, why are you talking to my baby? Like, you know, I explain, say it's a kid who's one, they have some teeth. You know, I, I tell my children, here's a toothbrush, right. here's what to do. And because you know, as your kids get older, you're like, oh my gosh, they knew everything that I was saying, <laughs> right? And so just because yeah. maybe they don't have the vocabulary yet, doesn't mean they can't understand and comprehend. Yeah. And then treat them with that respect yeah. um, of how you should be spoken to. Yeah, absolutely. Know? And that goes a long way in the way that they respond. Yeah. So, so you and I work together with tongue-tied patients. You know, I, I love the patients where I can say, hey, there is no tie, or, or maybe go see Casey or see Cairo, do some work there, and then maybe we don't have to do anything, but sometimes we do. So I always tell my patients that I want them to work with someone like you before the procedure and after the procedure. Yes. Can you explain why it is that that's important? Because sometimes it seems like a lot. It's like you have to go get a tongue tie procedure. Maybe they need to see Carl, and they need to see you. You know, why is it that we're making them go through all of this? And especially bio. Why do we want bio before and after the surgery? Yes, absolutely. So with a tongue tie release, just like any other surgery, it's a muscle, right? So we want to be able to prepare that muscle and prepare the family and the patient for what it is they're about to go through. And although the procedure itself is relatively um, not painful, but the before and the after and the, funk, the muscles around there, there can be some pain. So we want to kind of prepare the patient for that. Um, so pre-op therapy, we're looking at um, teaching them what we're going to be doing after. We're looking at the function, the movement of the tongue, up and down, left and right, the suction because we don't want to just go release the tongue without having that function after. Um, but then we go through the procedure. Part two is now the neuromuscular re-education. So everything you've learned in part one, now you've had this procedure, now let's make it muscle memory and understand the rhyme to the reason why we did this, where our tongue is resting. We talked about that from the beginning, but post-op is when we really, this is going to be our new oral resting yeah, posture. Yeah, they can do that. Look yeah. at that, you know, like I always think of it like if we had, say your fingers were like this, and you're born like this, and I release your fingers, you're still going to use your hand like it's a mitten. Yeah. Unless someone teaches you how. Yes. Right? And then, and then also, especially on the older kids, if you're going to do a procedure, and then we're going to make you do all these stretches and post-op care afterwards, I want you to be very comfortable before the right. procedure doing the actions, you know, doing the exercises, that way we don't do a, a procedure and now you're in discomfort. Right. And now go we'll start all the exercises when you're in pain. So you want to be like, you said, almost like muscle memory. Right. And now, okay, now your tongue is loose and free and now you can move it as you should. Right. Let's do that with what you've been doing. So yes. I think it's absolutely critical. I always, I almost make it mandatory. Yeah. You know, and, and, and there's very few cases where I'll do it without, yeah. you know, working with someone like you to help the family through it because I always say I can release your tongue 100% today but if we're not doing the post-op care you're going to be at 50% yeah. right so so a lot of that is all the work that goes into it afterwards yeah those so. restrictions all of that tightness um, I love that analogy and yeah. then also saying to the parents you're like the tongue has been this way since birth yeah. so it's mm -hmm. been functioning as a tongue a ton yeah. time all of this time so it does require that pre and post-op and the, I also love doing, you know, recommending the body work yes. to help re, re, uh, relieve the pain and tension in other areas of the body. And this holistic approach looking, our body is not yeah. silos, no, right? We're yeah. one functioning yes. human. So putting all the pieces together and achieving those optimal outcomes. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I just love working with you. I just really appreciate your time today. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I, I just thanks so much for all the work you do and for coming out and, and doing this. Thank you. Yeah, you too. Yeah, Appreciate it. it. Yeah. Thank you. Right, Bye. <laughs>